So Newton Thomas Siegel, you were the uh, cinematographer of Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, which not only is this big box office behemoth, but has also become a major awards player. Um, as we're talking right now, we're just two days out from the Golden Globe Awards where the film picked up an, a win for best film drama and also for best film drama actor for Rami Malek. Uh, first of all, could you just tell us a bit about um, you know, your reactions to hearing that news? I mean, when you were working on this, did you expect that it was going to be a Golden Globe award-winning film. You know, when I was working on Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, we knew, everyone knew there was something really special going on. We knew that Rami was, it, it, we were all watching a magical performance. So um, I never really uh, had any doubt in the, the power and the, you know, and what was coming together for the movie at all. But it was a tough production and, you know, movies are like lightning in a bottle. And I never, you know, at least for me personally, I don't really go into movies thinking there's, you know, oh, this is gonna be an award or an Oscar or any of those things. I go into, you know, wanting to tell a great story. And I finished the movie and the movie came out and I'm now in uh, uh, Thailand in the middle of another film. And I was uh, in the middle of trying to do a six minute scene in Bengali uh, language that I had to kind of guess at where it was in the scene. Um, it was a really stressful shooting moment on the movie I'm on now. And my phone starts like buzzing and buzzing. Ordinarily I would ignore that. And I see that it's won a Golden Globe and that Rami's won a Golden Globe. And I, yeah, I have to say, I was I was sort of flabbergasted, not because I didn't believe in the beauty of the film, but because uh, you know it it had been a, such a tough road to get there, and I was in such a different headspace shooting another movie when I got this uh, um, when I got the news. It 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 amazed me, and it was such a wonderfully gratifying uh, a feeling because of so much effort that was put into this movie by so many people that really, really believed in it. And it sounds like a cliche, but uh, in all the movies I've done, I, I've never quite seen um, this confluence of, of people's belief in the project they're working on, you know. Um, our very last day of shooting, the very last shot we did in principal photography was a close-up of uh, Rami, uh, Freddie, in Brazil, when he's looking out at the crowd and they're all uh, singing Love of My Life. And I remember that moment because uh, I was on the camera, on the dolly, and it was just sort of like a little bit of a push into a close up and he's sort of teary eyed. And we cut and uh, we all knew that was our last shot. and. Everybody's on the stage, sort of around the dolly, camera pointing at Rami. And after we cut, he just went into this thank you speech to uh, the rest of the cast and the crew that I got to tell you was so emotional. Um, people were getting all, all weepy eyed. And that doesn't usually happen on a movie, at least not on many movies I've worked on. So it when I heard the news that it was getting an award, when I saw the way it, the movie was received uh, by the public, um, yeah, I was flabbergasted. And, and I felt so good because I was concerned that all of this unbelievable effort and love that people were putting into it um, would be for naught. And all of a sudden to see the movie received by the public so phenomenally, which obviously it has been, uh, and then um, get uh, begin to get critical uh, recognition from the Golden Globes. It's terrific. You know, it's 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 an amazing phenomena. Well, congratulations again on that. Um, it's a very ambitious movie stylistically, and and in terms of all the ground that it covers. Um, take us back to I guess the very beginning of what your initial ideas were for, you know, how to tell Freddie Mercury's story visually? 
Um, well, you know, I, I knew about Queen, uh, you know, growing up, and I liked the music. I wasn't like a super Queen fan. I didn't know that much. Like a lot of Americans, I, I kind of knew the music without being a real aficionado of the band, the way that uh, I think people were more in Europe almost. So when I got the 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 script and the opportunity and Brian Singer asked me if um, I would be interested, you know, I, I, was, I, I, I love music and I was, I jumped right in there and I started wanting him to look at movies with me, like at other, other things that might give us some direction or, or idea of what we wanted to do. Um, and uh, initially we looked at a couple of films like uh, The Rose or The Doors and he made it very clear. And I think Graham King was also very clear and it was in the script that unlike a lot of music biopics, the film didn't want to be this sort of meteoric rise to stardom and then descent into the hell of, you know, drugs or addiction and ending in a tragic death before the artist's time, which, you know, like The Rose or like m many, many movies, uh, biopics that have been done about uh, musicians, that in this case, we wanted to do something a little different, that really paid homage to the band, but particularly to Freddie Mercury, what he represented, what he went through, what he meant, and celebrate the music along the way and celebrate what it means for, uh, for very different human beings to come together and create this sort of magical canvas of music and, and really celebrate the music. We had this amazing thing, which is we had access to the entire uh, Queen Library. We could use any song we wanted. So um, from the beginning and the way the movie is framed with Live Aid, uh, we, um, uh, you know, wanted it to be a celebration of, of the music and we wanted to, to structure it, to photograph it uh, and to put it together in a way that you really, you had trouble not singing along or stomping your feet. Um, and it was really uh, inspiration that Queen had when they did that Live Aid concert. But I didn't realize the really, um, beloved that performance was and um, how di disparate uh, uh, audiences and critics and music aficionados have called uh, Live Aid, like, if not the greatest, one of the greatest rock and roll performances of all time. My wife did the minute uh, I got the script and I said, oh, I think I'm going to be doing this movie about Freddie Mercury. She says, oh, my God, you have to watch Live Aid. And we, I, I think it might have even been before I read the script, we, uh, we watched it, you know, at home on a big screen. We watched the performance and I was like, oh my God. And then I read the script and the whole movie is framed by live. And I was like, whoa, this is going to be, this is going to be great, man. How do we do this? <laughs> and, um, and we did. And, you know, it's ironic because the live aid sequence was the sequence that scared me the most about getting it right and making it be the climactic scene of a movie. So it was a huge challenge, and it was the very first thing we shot, our first week of shooting, which was crazy. But um, it, it, it was that performance, everyone I know who was there live. I mean, I, I have a number of friends who are actually working as cinematographers, uh, doing a documentary or doing working on the live broadcast um, that the BBC put on. And they all said the same thing, was that it was a hot, uh, long, long day at Wembley and people were getting antsy and bored and tired. And at 6.40 p.m. when Queen came on 
and they hadn't raised that much money in the event, the thing exploded. And uh, that was why it was really important to get that scene right and to tell the story in a different way than you can see on YouTube. You can go on, on YouTube and Google the BBC live performance and you can see what the stage looked like. You can see the choreography. And that's what we reproduced truthfully and you know to the detail. But what we did different was we told the story from the inside out. We told the story of what the band meant to each other and what they meant to the audience. Um, as Freddie always said, you know, I, I play to the guy way in the back of the stadium in the very last row. And was what we had to figure out how to do for Live Aid. And uh, I'm amazed actually that it seems to, even from people that aren't huge fans of the movie, that that scene has universally been praised and loved. Well, I mean, it's like a little short film in and of itself, you know, I mean, this like 20 minute concert. I mean, what was your, I mean, uh, tell us just a little bit about, um, you know, how you, I guess, cracked it visually, you know, like from your, from your uh, uh, standpoint, from your position. Well, you know, I looked at his real performance a lot and I studied it. <clears throat> we reproduced the stage precisely down to the Pepsi cups. Uh, I, I actually initially lobbied for, you know, uh, um, do we really need to have these like shameless product placement kind of things on the piano? But uh, Brian was very committed to reproducing what was there faithfully. The, the Aaron Hay, our production designer, had, you know, the exact amps, the, the, the instruments, that everything was, was reproduced. Um, as faithfully as we could. We built a, a complete replica of the stage. Uh, there's no Wembley anymore, any, in Wembley Stadium, it's, it was torn down and rebuilt. So when we're looking out at the crowd, uh, that had to be recreated with extras and, and CGI. But um, in looking at the broadcast and knowing that what I was trying to do was tell the story about what was going on in between all the band members and the relationship they had to the crowd and how they discovered that it was working um, made me want to almost never reproduce a single shot that you saw in the BBC uh, broadcast. Because that you can, you can just watch by, by Googling it. But I tried to find ways, whether it's through the movement of the camera, the angles that we used, um, the incorporation of the crowd into the shots, not only the ones behind Freddie uh, or behind the band, but the, um, uh, the way that we could put them into even profile shots. And the relationship that began to evolve especially when uh, Freddie did um, uh, uh, the AOs and Gaga, and you see how the crowd is getting more and more incorporated into the, into the, um, into the concert. So initially, the movie opens where you see, you never see Freddie's face. You see him waking up, and you see him backstage, and you see him about to go on from behind and the curtains open and you see that there's a hundred thousand people waiting to see what he's going to do. And you never see his face. And then we come back to 1970 and that's when we introduce you from the front to, to Freddie Mercury. And we tell the story of Freddie and the band from his first arrival in London to coming back to, the Live Aid concert. So when we come back to it at the end, um, uh, it, it was important how we reintroduce the um, concert to the to the movie, and that's done with a, a, a really wide aerial over London, where you come in, you dive into the stadium. And you see the crowd because it's um, really more 
about the people now and what's going to happen. And we're coming up and up and up into Freddie, literally from the aerial all the way to him on the stage in one shot. And we begin to wrap around Freddie. And that's the moment when um, we have our one variation from what they did. We put a pause into Freddie right before he starts to play. And this was all a continuation of this one magical shot. And it's really a moment for Freddie and for the, our cinema audience to think about where the band, but especially Freddie, have gotten to at this moment and what's happening psychologically. And uh, unfortunately, this one continuous shot we have to cut into to see the other uh, members of the band wondering like, what's going on. And we come back to the second part of this aerial where it's now in a close up and the camera is wrapping around Freddie and he starts to play Bohemian Rhapsody. And you see the crowd in the background behind Freddie. Uh, the camera's like here and he's playing, um, actually the camera's here technically, and the crowd is out there. And we do a little bit of an old fashioned dolly zoom where the camera uh, is slowly coming into him. Uh, and by moving the camera in, uh, excuse me, by pulling the camera away, but by zooming in, we're bringing the crowd more and more into uh, Freddie's world, into the cinema audience's world. So it goes from being this sort of wider field of view of all the people behind him to the audience coming closer and closer and closer to Freddie as he starts the concert. We reintroduce uh, Live Aid at the end of the movie, and um, it's our sort of jumping off our launching point to this, um, you know, incredible performance and what it meant for, you know, 100,000 people um, that day. We, we really wanted to make, like you said, it's almost like a, a little mini um, where you, as a cinema goer, can really feel like, you know, you're part of this concert, like you're watching it live. Right. Um, aside from that, I wanted to ask you, the movie has a very vibrant color palette. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, what your ideas were for that. You know, if you had like a progression in mind for the for the film thematically, uh, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the, um, uh, the movie takes place from 1970 to 1985. And the band, obviously, you know, uh, Freddie went from, you know, having a summer job as a baggage handler at Heathrow to being one of the biggest uh, movie stars in the world. Uh, movie star, to being one of the biggest music stars in the world um, in a relatively short period of time. And the world also really changed. If you think about what was happening uh, in 1970 compared to 1985, a huge cultural sea shift happened. Uh, Queen came to... Um, uh, came to, to stardom at the tail end of the cultural, uh, the counterculture movement, uh, um, war in Vietnam, the um, hippie movement, all of that was at its height when Queen first came together and it was um, transforming radically by the time Queen was becoming um, a big uh, phenomenon, a big sensation. Uh, and glam rock was starting to take over. Uh, the, the war in Vietnam came to an end. Uh, and the, eventually, by the end of our movie, you know, disco had taken hold. So it, it was a huge cultural change, uh, as well as obviously a huge journey that Queen itself took in the course uh, of our story. So I wanted that to be reflected in the look of the movie. And I did that through a combination of a few essential elements. Um, the choice of lenses uh, and filtration and uh, what we call a lookup table or the, um, uh, the way that the colors were treated in the recording of the film uh, uh, at the beginning to the way uh, the lens choices uh, and the camera platform 
and the way the whole color palette was dealt with at the end. So it begins um, with very, very old, uh, what we call Cook Speed Pancro lenses. It has a very warm, uh, kind of golden, romantic, idealistic look at the beginning. Uh, it's these young, starry-eyed, uh, uh, you know, musicians who, um, you know, are, are are looking to find their way in this, in the, in the crazy world of rock and roll. Uh, and then by the time you're, you've gotten to Live Aid, uh, the, the look is much sort of, um, it's a little starker, it's more desaturated, uh, it's more um, kind of unblinking or um, and certainly less idealistic than it is uh, at the beginning of the movie. Um, it's kind of a sharper focus. Um, so... Uh, it was, a, you know, I was given uh, a, a faithful palette in terms of wardrobe and production design from Julian Day, our costume designer, and Aaron Hay, our production designer, to work with and then uh, mold uh, through lens choices, uh, color choices, in lighting choices uh, from the beginning of the movie to the end. And... I tried to do it in a way that um, it wasn't like a light switch, like, you know, 1980 and all of a sudden everything looks different. But um, the from the time that they get signed as a band and they tour America and they start to become a sensation to have a kind of um, almost like a you would have a dissolve in a film. The look um, is gradually shifting and uh, hopefully you don't really notice it and to kind of think back on it and go, whoa, it looks really different here in 1985 than it did in 1970. Um, and then there's things along the way that helped me do that, uh, like when they go on top of the pops. And I actually used uh, period video cameras from the day to record that. Uh, later when we uh, did the I Want to Break Free video, we shot that not only on film, but with the actual camera that recorded Freddie and even recorded his very last video, Who Wants wow. to Live Forever, which was really spooky uh, to be shooting Rami with the same camera and lens that um, Freddie was photographed with right up to the last moment of his life. I, it was kind of magical and spooky at the same time. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly a lot of hard work went into the making of this movie, and uh, I think that it really paid off. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much, and congratulations on your work. It, it was my pleasure. And as we say here from where I'm filming in Thailand, kap kum kap, to all the people that really have, uh, you know, embraced this movie. I, I, I knew we had something, but I never knew the world would recognize it so much. And it's phenomenal. I've worked on films that have had huge box offices before, but I think in a funny way, I've never felt that a film that I've worked on, you know, deserved it more than this. So, um, it's a huge shout out to all the people that are supporting the movie and to, uh, you know, Graham King and Dennis O'Sullivan that spent 10 years trying to get this thing off the ground. I can't believe what they went through. But of course, most of all to, uh, to Rami's like sensational performance because all the beautiful lighting in the world doesn't mean anything if he hadn't delivered. So from that point of view, beyond even thank you to all the people that are embracing the movie, I have to say a, a massive thank you to Rami and and what he brought to this movie, just phenomenal. Well, I, I've heard him mention you a lot in interviews as well. So, you know, I, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations again. Thank you. Yeah.